Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to talk to you about the 5 things that I will be learning in 2021 as a .NET developer. There will be more things that I will be learning probably, uh, but learning is a process. These are the things I would like to master or have mastered by the end of 2021. And as a .NET developer who's sharing his knowledge with the community, I think there's value in you knowing where I'm heading because it might be where you might want to head and I might actually end up making videos on any of those topics which I don't. Uh, have yet. So if you like this is a cool idea, let's go straight into the video and go to the first thing, which is Microsoft all -ins. Now, some of you might be familiar with the terminology, some of you might not. I'm not going to dive too deep into those things because they actually are huge topics uh, worthy of their own videos. Uh, I'm going to just briefly mention what they are and what they do. So in case you don't know, Microsoft all -ins is a framework for building robust, scalable, distributed applications. And what does that mean? Because you can say that, uh, you know, except for robust, uh, a REST API is a scalable and could be distributed application. Uh, so what makes Orlean special? Well, Orlean was developed internally by Microsoft Research, and there's actually a very good paper published uh, about it. I'm gonna put it in the description down below. And it introduces the virtual actor model as its programming paradigm. And actors as a concept, uh, might be new to you. I won't be diving too much or actually at all in, into what it actually is, but imagine an actor as being a piece of domain logic that is built by uh, state, identity, and logic. Um, for example, if you're playing an online game, a player might be a grain, or an event that happens, like a game event, could be another grain. Um, and all these things come together with their own logic contained, and it can be in memory or persisted and can be split across a cluster and scale in that way. And it's been used internally in Microsoft extensively, uh, at least from what we know, from what they tell us. Um, for example, Halo's online service is actually using the exact thing that I mentioned, where a player is a grain and when you join a 32 by 32 match, there are 32 grains on its side and there's a single game grain. Um, and then the leaderboard can be updated with the player stats and that sort of thing. Uh, it has two main models, at least that's a very clear separation that you can make at the very top level. It's the grains or actors, and it's also the silos or nodes in the cluster. However, you can have other configurations as well. So it's not necessarily one node per silo, you can have other configurations. Now my friend and colleague Stu has a YouTube channel called Coding with Stu, where you can actually go there and see a deeper introduction on the matter. I think he has a very great introductory 15 minute video, which you can check after this video. Um, and I'll leave a link in the description in the top right corner of your screen in case you want to check it out. Now, the next thing I'm going to be learning is something called source generation and came with C sharp nine or source generators. And very briefly, source generators aim to effectively enable compile time metaprogramming. And for those of you who don't know, reflection is a form of metaprogramming. And metaprogramming is when your code is able to analyze itself and build on top of it in some way. For example, use metaprogramming or reflection to add behavior to a class during runtime. Now, sort of generators wanna do that on compile time. And the benefit is clear, by having a compile time, it can be safer because it's compile time checked it can also be very, very much faster because it's nothing that you have to do during the runtime. Uh, for example, the Web API, the framework, uh, does a lot of reflection and metaprogramming on startup to wire the application up. But by using source generation, it can do all of those things upon build time and really speed up your application. So a very nice way to think about it. It's basically reflection about compile time. This is not entirely true, so don't use that. Like, Don't quote me on this, but if you just getting introduced in the in the subject and you want to think of it that way it's not wrong to think of it as this but obviously you have to write the generators it's not as simple or as automatic as reflection what i want to do this year with them is to learn how they work learn how i can use them and potentially integrate them with things i have already we talked on the uh, mapster channel about code generation and how mapster can actually generate the mapper using uh, code generation, where I want to see how we can transfer that into a DI framework um, using source generation. And for those of you who don't know, .NET Core or ASP.NET, the DI framework that's built in, it is actually using dictionaries and some very minimal reflection uh, for especially the first instantiation of the classes 
to to create them and this obviously takes some time and we can really really improve on that by using source generation and there are actually multiple projects in the past few months um, that entertain this idea of a source generator i'm going to leave this link here in the description down below for you to check out for example there is already a di framework that is using source generation which is really really promising which you should check out now the next thing i'm going to be learning is grpc grpc is nothing new it is another uh, remote procedure call framework and what's special about it is that it really uses modern ideas and technologies to make it worth using for example it's built on top of http2 uh, and it supports bi-directional streaming which means for example that when the client establishes a connection with the server both the server can send to the client and the client can send to the server through the same connection it also uses protocol buffers or protobuf a subject that we have covered in this channel and it uses that as a standardized um, layer to generate both contracts client and servers with again code generators and that makes it really easy because you only have to share your protobuf file and then the language generators will do the rest for you and you only get to play with the cool things which for example are um, inject this service here do this thing on this call and that's it you're good to go and it's way faster than rest for example or any other um, traditional HTTP API approach uh, but it's also way more niche because people can't just call your API without knowing your contract up front there's more negotiation that needs to happen before you're able to use it and yes there are ways for grpc to actually expose the protobuf file and the client can integrate with that but this is another process and i think at least at this point i would want to use it more on internal services to speed up uh, any communication in, a, in an internal system without exposing it externally yet but i think that now, after I think it's four or five years now that there has been a major release for GRPC, I feel very confident in using it. And I know many people that use it in production already, and I want to master it. Now, the fourth thing in my list might look a bit weird, but for me, it's going to be Terraform. So for those of you who don't know, Terraform is an infrastructure as code technology, and it is a DevOps technology. Infrastructure as code is the idea that you can define your infrastructure your solution your architecture the system that needs to be in place to run your code as code effectively and terraform is a standardized technology across multiple providers which allows you to do that for example you might be currently using arm templates in azure to uh, provision in different environments your infrastructure or you might be using CloudFormation in aws those things ultimately go through a parser which calls APIs, the Azure APIs and AWS APIs. Terraform effectively standardizes all that. It says, here is an Azure provider or here is the AWS provider. We cannot call the APIs for you. You just get this standardized uh, thing to write or describe your infrastructure. And the cool thing about it is not only are you able to use a single language to define, for example, a multi-platform approach, but it also makes it very easy to hire DevOps engineers, for example, or communicate with other people because it's this single common thing that if you know you know it for every provider the only thing that changes are the services you know this is a lambda this is an azure function this is an sqs uh, queue and so on and so forth and you might be thinking why a devops technology right i'm a software engineer i don't care i think in today's age and for the past couple of years actually that, that has been the case a software engineer that knows devops technologies is very very valuable and i think in today's day and age if you want to add value to yourself the one thing that you can do that will literally add tons of value and it's relatively easy to do is to learn devops not move to devops still main thing you're doing is software engineering but be very familiar with it because devops engineers are way less around the world and by being able to offer to a degree some of the things that they offer means that you automatically become more valuable. So this is why I have been for years and now I'm still learning DevOps technologies because it does add value to myself. And like I said before, Terraform supports multiple cloud providers, for example, Azure, AWS, GCP, DigitalOcean, 
many, many more others. They have a dedicated page on that. And the only thing that changes are the resources. The configuration um, can be centralized. It can be version controlled. You can actually have CI for your Terraform code. It's very, very cool what you can do with it. And I highly recommend you get into this. It can also be used for deployments, not just infrastructure. In fact, I am using it for deployments as well. And it's just a great thing for a software engineer to learn if they want to grow and if they want to add value to themselves. Invest in yourself by doing other things as well around your main subject. The last thing that I'm going to be doing, it's not really learning, but more catching up with the six glue technologies. Uh, by the way, don't Google glue tech. I called that before I knew that glue tech was a type of weed. So be careful what you search and that's how I call it. Don't, don't call that. Um, or I didn't tell you about it. So what are the six glue techs and why I call them like this? Well, glue tech is something that brings services together. For example, microservices. So you might have a consuming messages microservice. You might have an API, which is using some database. You, all those things need to come together. And those six things are the most common technology that I've seen personally to bring those things together. And I'm going to tell you what they are. And I have videos on some of them, and I'm planning to make way more videos on them this year. First, we have Azure Service Bus and AWS um, SNS or SQS, or both actually, because they imitate the Service Bus model, but effectively some messaging technology. And messaging technologies are very helpful for multiple reasons. They can load level your service. They can enable a pub sub scenario where one message is being published and multiple consumers can get notified on it. For example, the stock API in a pr uh, product catalog, for example, needs to consume that an item was bought to remove it from stock. But also it might be that if this item reaches less than five in stock, then we reduce its price to clear it. So the clearance system might actually consume that message as well. Service buses are really helpful for your system. And I'm doing cloud development, so I'm using cloud technologies for those things. Then we have Azure Cosmos DB and AWS DynamoDB. I am using both of them actively, and I think that they're great technologies. Like I said in my AWS and Cosmos DB video, bringing them together would create the best NoSQL managed database. If you want a deeper explanation of what they are, you can watch that video instead. Top right corner of your screen right now. Next, we have Redis, distributed in-memory key value caching uh, technology. Really, really helpful. We've covered it on this channel as well. You're going to find the link in the description for that. Really, really, really speeds up your application. If you don't need to frequently access something straight from the database, you go to Redis, you get the value from that, and you return it. Then we have Kafka Kinesis and Event Hub. And these things are effectively eventing or event streaming. Um, and they are used in high throughput scenarios where, for example, Uber would use Kafka or Kinesis or whatever they're using. I think it's Kafka to ping where the driver is when they're coming to you. And this ping would build the route. And you can use them in many, many scenarios, for example, IoT, or in, in general, in a scenario where you have um, dumb producers, where you just create events very, very fast, and you have multiple consumers in different topics that want to subscribe to those things and consume them very, very fast as well. And those high throughput scenarios, events or event streaming makes more sense. So that's why you use them. Then we have Elasticsearch. Another thing that I really want to make a video on because it's one of my favorite new technologies. And it's one of those things where search is everywhere. And by trying to make your own like complicated searching mechanism by using, I don't know, I've seen some weird things with SQL Server or RDBMS in general, while Elasticsearch, once you get it, once you understand it, can really build a very, very powerful and scalable searching platform for you. And even analytics and metrics and aggregations. All of those technologies are using this behind the scenes. It's such a wonderful tool. And I can't believe I was so late to the party uh, learning this. And I need to catch up with all the new features because they've been doing some amazing job uh, back at Elastic. And last but not least, Azure Functions and AWS Lambdas. I'm at the point where I'm using more Lambdas in my production systems than microservices. 
Of course, a REST API is a REST API, and there's an argument that you can create a REST API with an Azure function. I'm not very confident on that yet, and I'm not jumping on that ship yet, but consuming from Event Hub, you can use a, an Azure function. Consuming on changes from Cosmos DB, you can use an Azure function. Consuming from messages or even Redis notifications. You can do so many things, while the only thing you do is you write a very small piece of code, put it on some server, paper execution and go to sleep and know that it will scale automatically because Microsoft or AWS or GCP, if you're using GCP, will manage it for you. So these are the six glue texts that I'm using and I want to remaster and relearn in 2021. That's all I had for you for this video. I hope you found this helpful. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my GitHub sponsors for making this video possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.